We have the top of the hour, so thank you everyone for joining us today. I am Rachel Paul with IAAP and G3ICT. You're here for our NeuroAbilities webinar on exoskeleton technologies. Before we start today's program, just a few items to go over. We do have closed captioning options. Uh, you can select the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen to begin closed captioning. All attendee mics are muted to prevent any background noise or disruptions. We will have time for some questions today, so we encourage you to leave your questions throughout in the Q&A box. And we'll be monitoring the chat for just general questions and any technical issues. And today's webinar will be recorded and available on the NeuroAbilities YouTube channel, which we will share in the chat as well once we begin. So I'm happy to turn it over to Christopher Lee to begin today's program. Thank you, Rachel. My name is Christopher Lee and welcome to one of the 12 webinars from NeuroAbilities. We are um, glad to have you here today. We have a very interesting topic. Um, as Rachel mentioned, and we have a great panelist. Um, I do want to mention that this um, webinar is brought to you by G3ICT, which is the Global Initiative for Inclusive ICTs. Our sponsor is the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. It's also brought to you by NCAM, the National Center for Adaptive Neurotechnologies, as well as IAAP, the International Association for Accessible Professionals. Again, my name is Christopher Lee, and go to the next slide, please. And we have um, over, I'm excited to say today, we have over um, 89 people registered for the webinar today. We're in 25 countries and um, we're looking forward to having great participation. We want some questions to come in. We'll make this somewhat informal. The panels will be um, on, on um, their screen and um, be able to answer the questions. We wanna tell you a little bit about um, no abilities and there's a slide for that, which we will share. Um, NeuroAbilities explores the contribution for neural technologies aided by artificial intelligence, AI, and other advanced technologies. Um, the whole goal of it is to improve people's lives. So this is obviously an important topic, say topic on exoskeleton technologies right in. So um, I'd like to bring on Sandy. Sandy, um, it is great to have you here. You are with Touch the Future, the CEO of Touch the Future. And I'm going to open this up so you can um, introduce the panel. Hi. Here we go. We've got slides coming. Um, I'm happy um, to be a part of this event. This is um, very near and dear to my heart. I'm getting terrible echo here. Yeah, we're getting some feedback. If if um, if everyone just could keep their, their mic off, I know all the individuals that we have part of this have the mic off, but all the speakers, if you keep your mic off, unless you're speaking, of course. So go ahead, Sandy. Um, yeah, um, next slide, please. So I'm, ha I'm happy um, to be a part of this. Um, the walking technologies and exoskeleton technologies are near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm excited. Um, to be the moderator today and, um, and would like to introduce our um, speakers um, for today. So we have Michael McKinley, who's a co-founder and vice president of Phoenix Sudex. We have Amber Walter, who is the clinical science manager and board certified in neurological physical therapy at Sheltering Arms Institute. Um, Jeff Hopkins, who's a supervisor of recreation therapy and creative arts therapy at James Haley Veterans Hospital. Um, he's also an exoskeleton user. Marco, Marka Daniel Rogers is a teacher and advocate and a mentor, and she actually uses a stance control system um, by Audubon. Next slide. So when we look at the different walking technologies, um, it's important to understand um, there's an evolution of, of technologies. You have active versus passive. So um, the active systems, meaning that they're fully robotic. So like uh, the first one that was FDA approved was the rewalk system. And now we also have 
um, the indigo and um, the phoenix that are um, there. Um, Rewalk also um, recently got um, in October um, Medicare coding. Um, so we're on our way um, here in the US um, with, with those opportunities. So exoskeletons being um, the fully robotic, um, actively moving the person. Um, then there's also the stance and swing control or just stance control where um, they're more of a passive system that engage when the individual uses um, the, the muscles and that that they have. We have functional electrical stimulation systems that where electric stim is applied to the muscles in order to, pr to produce movement. Um, what's nice about the um, exoskeleton technologies and that is the evolution of what's happening of them um, being engaged in the global market as well as in the um, medical or, or, or rehabilitation area. So everything from injury prevention and increased productivity um, to increased function and improving the quality of lives. Um, the biggest challenges, of course, faced are, are reimbursement and um, policies. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Michael McKinley. Um, with um, the Phoenix Sudex um, organization and let him kind of share um, their journey within their organization, both um, engaged in the global industrial market and military and recreation, as well as um, heading into the medical world. Thanks, Sandy. Really appreciate the introduction here today. Again, my name is Michael McKinley. Uh, I'm a co-founder here at Sudex. I started my journey with exoskeleton systems in 2009 when I came out to Berkeley to start working on all sorts of uh, gate assistive robotic devices. Um, so today I'm gonna try to give you a brief history of what we're working on at looking at the Phoenix. Uh, our first slide here, just as a, a little reference, um, is an image of our building today. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of different robotic systems that we're developing at the same time. So it's about 18,000 square feet where we do all our design, manufacturing and testing in house. And uh, it's really exciting to see things that have been in the lab for a long time, slowly coming into the real world through our manufacturing department. So if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, Sudex co-founders, myself and our CEO, Professor Kaz Rooney, and some of our other colleagues from Berkeley have been working on exoskeleton systems since the early 2000s. So it's kind of amazing to think that we're almost 20 years now from when the first uh, Berkeley lower extremity exoskeleton system came out, which is uh, the picture on the left side of the screen here. Uh, these devices were really focused towards military uh, requirements. And over time, we started to, to transition things towards um, you know, medical and industrial applications. So it's really exciting for me to see that trickle down effect from these big investments on the military side, moving into things that you and I can get exposure to on a daily basis. So on the left, we have a picture of Bleaks, which was one of the first uh, fully autonomous systems as in it didn't have to plug into a wall. And then Hulk was the commercialized, uh, ruggedized version for the military in 2009. And then on the right was our first prototype for the Austin project, which was the precursor uh, to the Phoenix that we have today. So it's exciting to think about 10 years later, if we move to the next slide, our vision for Sudex right now is looking at a combination of medical, industrial, search and rescue and recreational um, exoskeletons. And so, as you can imagine, all of those devices share very unique requirements um, in their separate fields. Uh, but one thing at Sudex that we like to try to do is develop what we call building blocks or Legos, if you will, of exoskeleton components, soft goods, and electronics software uh, that can be used in all three areas. And that way we can be constantly moving all these products forward um, so that we can achieve our goals of getting low cost, high agility, and um, improving quality of life for all of our users. 
So just to kind of describe what's on the screen here, on the left, we've got a picture of uh, Phoenix and a user in Phoenix. This gentleman is, uh, has a spinal cord injury and is able to walk using the Phoenix device. In the middle, we have a construction worker using one of our passive industrial exoskeletons to reduce the risk of his injury uh, during work. And on the right, we've got someone uh, who's a search and rescue uh, individual uh, testing one of our devices to do payload uh, offset um, so they can carry a heavy load deep into a search and rescue operation uh, for a long period of time. So we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so today I'd really like to focus on the Phoenix because I think that's really the most applicable technology uh, to talk about. Um, and the Phoenix we're really excited to announce is now available to, to, for sale for clinics. Um, it's an exciting piece of technology because it's embodying all of the elements that we've been studying for the last 10 years um, in, in trying to bring the weight down to a, um, a sub 15 kilogram uh, mass in trying to bring the battery life up as high as we can. Right now it's about four hours of continuous walking on a single charge. The device allows us to address a very large range of individual sizes. So everything from um, low four feet tall to about six foot four. So if you think about that, that's a very broad range of body types, uh, height and weight requirements. So the device is adjustable all the way up to uh, individuals about 200 pounds and a little bit higher depending on uh, what we need to do. And the device has been designed so that it can be uh, commanded using very simple user interfaces. It can be worn while seated in a wheelchair. And most excitingly, we now have FDA and CE approval for this device. Uh, so we're able to bring it into the market. You move to the next slide, please. So one of the main, as I mentioned, some of the main things for uh, the Phoenix here was to try to simplify the system so that we can make the device accessible on a financial level, simplify the user interface so that it's intuitive and streamlined to use, and enhance integration with wheelchairs so that you no longer have this dichotomy of either being in an EXO or being in a wheelchair. It needs to be kind of fluid so that you can transition throughout the day. If we move to the next slide, please. Just briefly comparing Phoenix uh, against our other devices on the market. Um, Right now, the main, uh, the main aspects, the main devices available are uh, the EXO, the Indigo, the Rewalk, and uh, now Phoenix. So these are the big devices in the United States. There's some new players in the field, but EXO, Indigo, and Rewalk are kind of the established uh, parties. We're excited to try to bring Phoenix into that, um, into that arena with similar features at uh, somewhere between you know, 60, $60,000 as opposed to over $100,000 for Rewalk and EXO. Uh, and we're also able to do that with the same number of power degrees of freedom. So we have motors at the hips and motors at the knees now. Uh, so it's, this slide is just designed to show you that we have many of the same features as the other products. And um, I can go into specifics of, of what each of these devices can and can't do um, in kind of a further discussion. If you could move the next slide, please. So just for some clarity, Phoenix is designed as a one, fits, one size fits all uh, product with uh, an adjustable torso and fully adjustable uh, leg modules. Uh, this slide is showing different angles of the Phoenix in the, in, in, from different perspectives, just so you have an idea of what it kind of looks like in space. Uh, all of our adjustments are tool free. So that allows us to do what we call size on the fly adjustments so that you can put the device on seated and then make final adjustments when standing. And we found that to be very helpful when you're in a clinical setting and it's difficult to get first measurements from someone. Uh, as you can imagine, your body changes substantially from when you're seated to when you're standing. Uh, take the next slide, please. One of the cool aspects of Phoenix is that we have a uh, a separable torso and leg module. So this image is showing how we have a quick disconnect feature uh, that allows us to separate the legs from the torso. And this is a nice feature for several reasons. So first of all, it allows the device to be moved in lighter weight uh, modules. So if you're seated in a wheelchair, it's possible for you to manipulate the device by yourself. 
Um, and second, it allows it to pack down into a small suitcase so that when you take it on an airplane or travel with it or um, move it from place to place, we no longer need this enormous box um, to try to move the device around. So we found this is a key element of um, accessibility here. Can you move to the next slide, please? So Phoenix was designed to be really streamlined in its uh, ease of usability. And this slide is showing some of those elements. So some of the design features that allow us to be really, really easy for the user to pick it up. And so the first element is that we have audio feedback uh, with some speakers that are placed in the lower back region of the device. This allows you to understand immediately what the device is doing and uh, what state that you're in. If you don't want the audio feedback or you're hearing impaired, we also have LED visual feedback uh, with LEDs mounted down near the hips. And that gives you the same, uh, the same cues in colored light uh, feedback mechanisms. And then the whole system right now is controlled by what we call our compact UI. Uh, that's a two button user interface that can be mounted on a crutch or some other uh, device. So if you move to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a close-up picture of uh, the user interface. So it's simply two buttons, a front button and a back button. And a front button moves you forward in a chain of commands and the back button moves you backwards in the chain of commands. So for instance, if you're seated, you'd press the front button to stand up, the front button to take steps. And then when you're finished taking steps, you take the back button to move your feet back together and then the back button to sit down. And everything happens intuitively and automatically. So it's, it's very streamlined once you understand how to do that. If you can move the next slide, please. What's cool about the user interface is it allows us to attach it really quickly to many different uh, stability aids. So this image shows three different ways that you can use it. One sliding on uh, parallel bars for kind of initial fitting and initial uh, learning. And then we can easily take the same user interface and attach it to a walker um, or attach it to a crutch. And what's cool about that is we find a lot of our uh, pilots that we work with will bring in their preferred uh, stability aid and we can just quickly uh, attach the user interface to the stability aid and they're up and going in a matter of minutes. Uh, one other cool thing I should mention is the user interface, once you get more advanced, has some automatic uh, gate options. So initially you command each step with the button press, but as you get more advanced with your abilities, you can use your torso to uh, take the next step automatically just by using your intention and in your, in your uh, body position. If you can move the next slide, please. So we have an image here showing uh, what the Phoenix battery pack looks like. It's attached to the back. Um, it's a quick swap switch system so that as you run out of power at the end of the day, you can swap in a second battery that's been on the charger. So right now the runtime is about four to eight hours for a single battery and the charge time is about one to two hours. And that means you always have a battery ready to go uh, so that you're, you're never out of gas. Uh, okay, if we move the next slide, please. So a cool aspect of Phoenix is that we have a mobile app that's designed to uh, tune all of your user settings. And uh, this app allows us really cleanly to move between settings and save profiles for different users. Um, and if you move to the final slide, please. Uh, that app is part of a bigger ecosystem here with Phoenix. Uh, so we use the app for initial adjustment and tuning. We use the user, user input um, for individual control. And then what's really cool about Phoenix is that we've developed an API uh, aspect to the code so that we can take data out and send uh, potentially new information in for more advanced research and development uh, with local test labs. Um, if you move to the next slide, please. So at the end of the day, we have a system that I'm exceptionally proud of. Um, and this picture is an example of um, one of our pilots who uh, just got married. Um, he met his bride when he was not injured. 
and uh, he really wanted to be standing and walking um, in his at his wedding. So you see the groom, you can hardly even tell, is, is wearing the phoenix. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, you can see his wheelchair is off to the side. So it was really cool to allow him to, to, uh, to have this option. And uh, it was a very powerful, uh, powerful thing for him because you can see he's got a, you know, his um, being able to stand up with his brothers and, and uh, have that picture on their refrigerator uh, they're all very proud of and proud of the, the family that they've uh, come to build here. Uh, so with that, I think we're, we're past our 12 minutes here. And uh, I just want to move to the final slide and say thank you for your time here. And I'm really happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, and we'll go from there. Yeah, and we'll, we'll be answering questions at the end. So, um, so I'd like to um, introduce our next speaker is Amber Walter, and um, she's going to talk about um, the therapy side of things. Thank you. Thank you all for having me this afternoon. Um, so I will say my talk um, on the, yes, therapy side sort of focuses on what Michael mentioned as that kind of medical setting, but a little bit of the medical rehabilitation um, and also wellness. So I just did want to disclose that I have been a consultant in the past. I'm certified on one particular exoskeleton, um, but I do not receive payment from that manufacturer. And um, I will talk about some different devices in the uh, presentation and um, none of that should construe any endorsements for one product. So why are these exoskeletons really important in the rehabilitation, fitness, and wellness settings? First, we can make use of principles of neuroplasticity or the principles that lead to brain and spinal cord change. And so there are sort of 10 top principles and I listed the ones that are most applicable to the use of exoskeletons. One, use it or lose it. So we can, uh, the exoskeleton can replace an activity like walking um, that we would be unable to perform any other way. Also um, being able to perform that much earlier than we could without an exoskeleton. Also use it in improvement. So just keep to be able to keep practicing that activity and perhaps with greater efficiency than in other ways um, like traditional um, rehabilitation may offer. The task is very specific. If you're working to retrain walking, that's what the exoskeleton can provide. It also can uh, generate activity um, in a very intense way. And this has been proven in some studies that really look at the energy output that people have when they're utilizing an exoskeleton. It also provides a lot of repetition. The use of an exoskeleton means you can perform an activity many times and often again in, uh, in, a, in a greater way than with other traditional therapies. Um, for instance, completing many steps. The activity with an exoskeleton, I would say, is very salient. Um, and so it really stands out as important to people. It's goal-directed. Um, and sometimes our traditional rehab approaches uh, fail to provide that salience that users need. Also, there's transference. So what um, has also been shown in research is that the walking activities we perform in exoskeletons may also benefit users in other tasks, like their stability in sitting. Secondly, besides neuroplasticity, uh, these exoskeletons really can act as an assistive device for walking. So if someone has limited ability to walk or is unable to walk, uh, they would be able to use the exoskeleton to provide that activity and sometimes is possible without, um, uh, excuse me, more than is possible with any other device. There may be secondary health benefits to users like improvements in spasticity or bowel function. And last, we can collect data useful to really understanding the rehabilitation or health outcomes of a user through these exoskeletons. So I'd like to present a few pictures to show the various designs of available exoskeletons. Again, I do not endorse any of these particular devices and each has its own approved uses um, that we're not going to review today. But each of these pictures through this slide and the next slide either have a backpack or a waste pack, which typically contains the battery and some major electronics of the device. There are straps down the legs that hold the robotic components to the user. 
the hips and knees are allowed to bend and the individuals are wearing their own footwear, but could have a plate inside of the shoe or outside of their shoe to support their foot and ankle. In the picture on the left, we see an individual standing um, and letting go of his forearm crutch to shake another's hand while using the indigo exoskeleton. Moving to the right, we see an individual wearing the Kyogo and he, or excuse me, the individual is climbing stairs using a single handrail, but no other assistive devices. And the last picture shows an individual outdoors using forearm crutches with the rewalk. The next slide shows three additional exoskeleton devices. So on the left, we see an individual wearing the XO, it's EKSO, with hands-on assistance from another person. The individual is using a cane on their left side. In the center is the Phoenix by Suit X that you just heard about. And the individual is wearing this exoskeleton and using forearm crutches. And finally, an individual is pictured with the HAL exoskeleton without holding any assistive device. So as you can see from these pictures, there are some various features in these different brands. And that is really excellent because it allows for a variety of user needs and abilities. Each device um, can vary in terms of its hardware, uh, which would lead to changes in weight. Um, so the devices I previously mentioned in the pictures weigh anywhere from about 13 and a half pounds to 50 pounds. Um, users do not typically have to take on the weight of this device while they're in it. Um, the robotic actuators allow that to be um, taken away while moving, um, but the lower the weight is important because it does increase portability, as Michael also uh, referred to. Also, there are uh, various stability devices um, which people can use, um, so they can use um, uh, rolling walkers um, and uh, plat with a platform on it if they don't have good upper extremity strength, forearm crutches or canes. Some users who need very minimal assistance from the exoskeleton, they may not even need a stability device. And then there are also various mechanisms of action which are really related to the software of the device. Some require postural changes or some can be initiated via a button. And this is, again, really helpful, their variety here, because users can really find a system that works best for them. Most of the devices work both indoors and outdoors, um, but I believe that Rewalk and the Kyogo may be the only devices that uh, negotiate stairs. In the picture, you see an individual standing in the exoskeleton, uh, which is difficult to notice because the exoskeleton is the same color, color as his clothing. It's black. He's using a platform rolling walker where both of his arms are supported at the forearm because he has a weakness in his arms as well. And two therapists stand beside him to really look at the fit and the alignment of the device. One of the most valuable features of the exoskeletons is they can be used in a variety of settings from hospitals to the community. So uh, for the, this chart, I've really tried to break up different um, uh, goals, frequency of use, and users that we would have in these different settings. So whether or not it be rehabilitation, which could be inpatient in hospital or residential setting or outpatient types of therapies, um, then fitness and wellness, and then in personal use. So our goals in rehabilitation are often working on improving skills. It may be improving skills in balance or in walking, really improving skills in being able to tolerate exercise after um, an injury or illness, um, being able to control stability in different parts of the body. And also for uh, therapists, for me, it was really helpful. I could see um, how was someone improving because as you could take down assistance with the exoskeletons, I'd be able to see if we were um, making gains or if you know, we needed another approach. But the frequency of use in the rehabilitation settings is gonna probably be the least frequent that we would see and maybe you know just two or three times a week. Uh, the users in the rehab setting also are usually um, having some medical issues, really needing some kind of monitoring, monitoring from a medical team. And um, these users also typically, in my experience, have less understanding of their overall body position and control and really need some structured guidance in that um, during their use of exoskeleton. In the fitness and wellness setting, um, we're really looking to sort of maximize those gains that might have happened in the rehab setting or maybe that someone already um, has achieved um, through traditional techniques. Um, 
So looking to increase endurance and strength, maintain their current function, really preventing decline. And the exoskeletons can also provide a way to perform other fitness activities in a standing position. So we don't always need to just focus on walking activities, but it might be utilizing upper extremity strengthening devices in a standing position. In the fitness and wellness settings, it's a little bit more driven by the user as far as how often they would like to use exoskeletons. So sometimes that could be up to five times uh, per week. And then users typically in this phase are medically stable and they really have their own goals um, for uh, continuing fitness and wellness. And then in the personal use setting, which you're going to have the pleasure of listening um, to people that uh, utilize the exoskeletons for personal use, um, really it could be to participate in work or recreational or personal activities in the standing and walking positions, again, to continue to maintain that function and prevent decline in function. And the real advantage then with personal use is you can use it as often as you want. And typically, um, users who take on personal use have been successful with use in these other settings, so maybe in therapy or maybe in a fitness setting. Uh, users typically definitely have an identified support system. Some devices may be able to use be used without an assistant, but many times a support system is needed to put um, potentially even put on the device um, or then support someone as they're standing and walking. And also personal users have identified goals. They really know what they want to use the devices for. So in my experience utilizing exoskeletons um, for both uh, the, the rehab environment and personal use, there definitely are a few expectations to manage. Um, people do need to have really good range of motion, skin condition, and fitness, and sometimes these things can be improved upon time if they identify as really wanting to use an exoskeleton. Everyone that I have worked with, really, there is a learning curve, so some people really need significant help when they start, but they all have made improvement over time. We do have to remember that the exoskeleton may not be for everybody, so sometimes um, the, a skilled trainer can really help guide that process really make sure the device is fitting well and that the user sort of understands what it can't do and what it can what it can do. So when I um, have brought people in that are interested in the device, maybe even in personal use, um, we, we talk a lot about, about what the device is, just looking at it without it even being on um, them yet. And then uh, we sort of do an evaluation, making sure they, they meet all the, um, the needs for the range of motion and the fitness. Um, and then we would also allow enough time to have the device um, put on go ahead and try it out, even though we know they're going to need a lot of help at first, and really just see if it meets their expectations. And so sometimes I've had that experience where someone didn't think it would be as much work as it was using, um, you know, a couple of leg braces in their assistive device. And then they found out maybe this is about the same amount of work. And so, um, you know, I'm okay with where I am. Everyone that I have worked with that has decided the exoskeleton is, is a good device for them though, has in, demonstrated improvement. And so sometimes that's just being able to manage the assistive device on their own. Also, we did participate in a three-person trial and, and showed that um, walking endurance and speed um, can improve even if people were previously participating in some other walking training. Barriers, which I think we're going to touch on a little bit uh, more today, do include, you know, needing those assistive devices, the physical help that may be needed um, for a user, and of course, cost. I just have a few references, which I think the handout or the slides will be provided um, at the end, and also try to include some resources of the various manufacturers that I mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amber. Um, that was great. And again, we will do questions at the end as we can. And then any questions posted in the Q&A or the chat um, that we can't get to, we will, um, uh, we will respond to after the session. So I'd like to introduce our, our next um, panelist is Jeff Hopkins. And he's going to um, kind of tell you his uh, experience in participating in a research at the Veterans Administration. Jeff? Thanks, Sandy, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, I first want to make a disclosure, I guess, and I want to thank Amber for making me aware that I probably need to do this. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Department of Veterans Affairs or more specifically James A. Haley Veterans Hospital. Um, this is where I work, but I'm speaking on behalf of myself. 
a veteran who, uh, who's been an exoskeleton user. So I just wanna make that, that clear. And then also um, Amber made a point, it makes people smile. Um, if you can't see from the photos and, and, and the video, hopefully that we'll see, it definitely made me smile. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I've been a wheelchair user for about 32 years now uh, from a motorcycle accident uh, right after I got out of the United States Army. Um, and this is the first time that I stood up in, in 30 years uh, when this actually took place. Um, I was very fortunate in that I work at James A. Haley Veterans Hospital in Tampa, Florida. Um, but we have an amazing spinal cord injury uh, program here with a huge research uh, department. And uh, fortunately, this uh, this exoskeleton uh, is is being you know they're they're doing research with this exoskeleton device. And again, I was very fortunate to uh, to get into uh, into the research project. The unfortunate thing is I got I got selected for the control group, so um, I got to use the exoskeleton uh, approximately about 20 times on and off, but not on a weekly basis. Um, and then I would use my wheelchair where the experimental group, they were using the exoskeleton, I, I believe somewhere around three to four or five times a week uh, for, for a good number of weeks. So um, the, the good thing though is, is following that, um, I was going to be allowed to go um, into the experimental group or not to the experimental group, but to continue using uh, this exoskeleton device. Um, at the time I was a new employee here, so I, I chose not to do that. Um, I have to admit since Sandy brought this to my attention, it's kind of uh, re regenerated my interest in this and, and wanting to get back. Again, as you can see, you hadn't stood up in 30 years. Um, it's quite an amazing experience. Um, neither my wife, if you're looking at the pictures, or if you can't see the pictures, picture on the left is me standing in the hallway here at my work where the research has taken place, um, standing up uh, with, with uh, some Canadian crutches. The photo on the right is a, family, is a picture of um, my wife and my two sons and my mom and dad. Um, and that's the first time uh, that my wife and my children have seen me standing up. So it really meant a lot, just something as simple as standing up for the first time. And it's kind of neat because if you, if you can't see the photo, um, I'm taller than the rest of my family, which kind of makes me feel good. Uh, so for the last 30, 30 some years, I've been the shortest one in my family sitting down in my wheelchair. Um, the, it, it was an, an amazing time uh, using this exoskeleton very fortunate. Uh, the photo that that you that's up now is of one of our physical therapists uh, helping me with the device. Um, one of the other things that Amber covered is that there is a learning curve to it. Um, this photo is probably from maybe my third time using this device. I don't want to say it was difficult, but it, it was definitely um, physically intensive for me. Um, I'm a uh, I'm a spinal cord injured veteran. Um, with a T6 spinal cord complete injury. So, um, so basically paralyzed from my mid chest down. Um, so it's, it's quite a bit of work. I'm really strong up top, but just uh, again, it, it's, there's a learning curve to it. Uh, hopefully down the road, um, we're gonna have other exoskeleton systems uh, in our VA here to where we, we can have options. This is the only one I've tried. Um, it, was, it was pretty heavy. Um, and, and part of why I, I didn't continue uh, using the device is, is because I just didn't think it was something that, one, I wanted the VA to purchase for me. I think it was somewhere around $80,000. And I just didn't feel that it was going to be something that I would use on a daily basis or even on a weekly basis, primarily due to its weight. Um, you know, if, if this is going to be something that works for me, it's, it's something I want to take when I go to the mall or when I go out, you know, to a recreational event or something else. I can just pop on while I'm in my wheelchair and can, uh, can get up and walk. Um, but again, it's, it, it's been an amazing experience. Um, one, I'm, I'm looking to continue again. I've, I've reached out to the, to the program and, and hope to get, uh, get back into it. Um, again, I think we're, um, our, with our technologies here, I think they're gonna expand and uh, give not just myself, but, but other veterans with spinal cord injury and, and other spinal cord uh, disorders and diseases opportunities to get up, to walk, to stand in your wedding. Um, go, going back to what Michael said, um, I wish I had that at my wedding. Uh, that is something that, I, that I'd wish for, but unfortunately I didn't have that 20 years ago. Um, but again, the technology is coming around and um, you know, down the road, hopefully I'll be in another exoskeleton suit 
and, uh, and be able to continue standing in front of my children, standing with my wife, standing with my family members, with my friends and, and participating in, in uh, sporting events, you know, utilizing this exoskeleton. So um, I think that's pr pretty much covers it. Um, I'm, I'm more than uh, happy to answer any questions if you have any on this particular, um, uh, on the use of this particular exoskeleton or just anything ab about me. Um, so please free, feel free to ask those at the end. And if there isn't time, I'm more than happy to answer any questions uh, via email. So uh, again, thank you to uh, Cassandra and Sandy um, and everyone uh, for this opportunity to speak. You can see here and the video is playing um, a brief video of, of Jeff um, utilizing the uh, rewalk exoskeleton with the um, using the lost ground crutches and the physical therapist providing some guidance support. It was it, it really was an amazing experience. Um, you, you see life in a much different way. Uh, again, after sitting in a chair for, for 30 years, um, uh, when, when I first started doing this, it's, you know, you're usually looking up at everybody. So it's really nice to kind of be at, at eye level with, with people uh, that you haven't, haven't been with in, in 30 years. So uh, again, just very fortunate. Um, this system is in several VAs and I believe we have both the rewalk system and the Indigo system here. Hopefully we'll be able to get some of the others that, that Michael mentioned. And, uh, and, and that way we have choices and, and can try various units, kind of like we do with hand cycles or other uh, adaptive uh, piece of equipment, you know, try out, you know, three or four different devices to see what works best for us. Um, and then, uh, you know, go through the trial of it and then, um, and then have the VA purchase that for us. But again, we're, we're, we're very fortunate as veterans, uh, you know, having served our country and now having our country take care of us. Thanks, Jeff. That was great. Thanks for sharing your story. And um, I look forward to seeing you up and moving again. Um, our next speaker is Marco Daniel Rogers, and she's um, going to talk about her experience. Um, she doesn't actually use an exoskeleton. She uses it one of the stance control devices um, and um, up to the evolution of where she is today. So, Marco. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to talk about this. Um, it's not really easy putting 27 years into five minutes, the highs and lows of the ever-changing life challenge by spinal cord injury, and all that entails could be written in a novel. Um, the disclaimer that has been brought up before, I'm going to add in there. Um, I do use Autobock, a pro Autobock product, um, and I have used the EXO, the EKSO system in therapy. Um, I don't sell anything. I have nothing to do with them. Um, I am a user. I am not a technology expert. Um, I use a mechanized KAFO and I've spent time trying to learn about all of the different options available to me available. I've tried BioNess and um, several different um, electrical stimulation systems. Um, none of the options that were there um, are covered by insurance. They're not deemed important or medically necessary. In 1994, I had my first of two cervical spinal cord injuries while working as a firefighter and an EMT. Um, a career change that I had to make to get health insurance for my son who was born with a pre-existing condition. And that's where my battles with health insurance began. Fortunately, my life's training as a ballet dancer made all of the difference in my recovery. And I was a walking quad. So the pictures that were previously up on the screen were me, the first one, me dancing um, professionally, the top right corner. Then below that directly is me after many years of rehabbing myself, um, teaching ballet. And then to the top left is after my second injury, me preparing a young local dancer for our Piccolo Spoleto um, event here in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, 18 years after my initial injury, I was driving home from teaching a class and a young girl ran a red light at high speed, T-boned me in the driver's door and left me immobiles from the shoulders down. In the next group of pictures, the two to the, the first on the left and the center picture are while I was in inpatient rehab. I was there for about two years, two months and then the picture on the right 
is me in a standing frame that I was fortunate to be able to purchase used. Um, it's another piece of equipment that is not deemed important or medically necessary. Um, as I said, I spent nearly two months in the hospital and I regained some minor functions. Um, with help, special equipment, I was able to start feeding myself a little bit, transferring from my chair to bed and a toilet. And as I said, I even went back to teaching from my wheelchair. I've now spent nearly nine years fighting for my right to have the health care that I and everyone deserves. Part of that was the right to try bracing. Even when my therapist thought I was crazy, thinking I'd never be able to stand, let alone walk. I even asked for a new therapist about two years into my recovery. And I pushed and I trained just as I had been taught as a young dancer. I prevailed with a trial for KFOs. Auto box EMAG active stance controls were suggested. And the next pictures, um, if you could go on. On the left, that's um, my orthotist. And that was the very first trial because you can't, I couldn't at that time, trial actual um, EMAGs. We simulated standing in knee immobilizers and AFOs and holding on for dear life to him, to the parallel bars, whatever I could. It was quite um, a challenge. All of this in five minutes just does not show the work that goes into that. Um, the picture on the right is my purple legs, I call them, the final product. So I got them and started working at using them, um, struggled to pay for them because they were not medically necessary. And I even challenged Blue Cross Blue Shield in the state appellate court by myself because I could not find a lawyer who wanted to help with my case. I lost, of course, and couldn't afford to try again in a higher court. But I was very lucky, a dear old friend paid for my braces. Um, during all of this time, I was challenged to do a high profile local 10K race. The race was in April of 2016. I'm not a racer. I have never even really liked to run, but I am an athlete at heart, as most dancers are. And I felt that this would be a great way to raise awareness for edu and to educate people about walking technologies for people with disabilities, as well as how poorly the medical system worked for people like me. I had an amazing supportive team, which included my original therapists. We trained, spoke out, shared what we were doing, and we did the race. We finished it in two hours, 41 minutes, and some seconds. Um, it was a glorious day, completely exhausting, but I proved a point. Life with a walking disability is doable, especially with walking technology. And all of these pictures on the screen are during the day of the race, um, being interviewed for a news channel. It was wonderful to be able to get the information out to so many. Now I use my braces at home almost daily. Um, I can stand in the kitchen and do things as I lean against the counter of the sink. And I'm managing better without both crutches at every moment. I think in time I'll feel more comfortable using them out of the house as well. But because I need the crutches, I can't use my arms and hands. So many things aren't available to me um, at this point. Uh, the first year that I had them, I went to a Christmas party and um, left my wheelchair at home. I ended up sitting through the whole party because I couldn't stand, hold a drink, talk with people, and everybody was mingling and I couldn't do that. Um, I also did take them to New York City to visit my son. Um, we would go to Times Square and yearly. Um, and I, my, some of my favorite pictures, they're not here, but side by side, one year with me in my wheelchair and my son, and the year later in the same exact spot, my wheelchair to the side and me standing, holding my son. Um, it was pretty amazing to be in the city and actually walk part of the time. Um, I think the biggest positive has been the after effects um, and much of what Amber was speaking about earlier. Um, my EMAGs have become a tool in my workout for increasing all of my physical abilities. Um, I've gained strength and balance, um, just more stable. I'm now standing and even taking a few steps without braces. 
It's not pretty and it's certainly not safe to do alone, but it's the beginning. I have no idea how far I'll go with this, but I do know that without the technology I have, I would not be living as high quality of life as I do now. Some say I'm an anomaly. Um, some say I'm an inspiration. I just say I'm stubborn. I wanna live my best life on my terms, not the insurance companies or a politician's terms. We all deserve this. The last um, picture was me standing at the top of the bridge during that race. And I remember specifically thinking and hoping that one day this kind of technology will be available to everyone who needs and wants it. Um, and the last little embedded video is me on my birthday this year, January, and the first time taking a few steps without any bracing. Um, Thank you all for having me. I really hope you'll watch the full, I have a little, I call it my infomercial, just talking about my journey. It's about a four minute, little over four minute video, and that will be available to you after. Um, thank you all so much for listening. Thank you so much, Marka. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, we wish you the best of luck on continued success. So in the battle together. <laughs> So what are the next steps here? You know, um, first is like they were talking about is understanding who can benefit. You know, there's things to consider. Um, everybody's disability is different. Um, for Jeff and I, um, when I trialed um, exoskeletons, it had been over 30 years, but I had been participating in standing frames and standing programs the entire time of my disability. And so my bone density was still okay for me to be considered. So taking into account all the medical considerations as well as contraindications is important, um, but also understanding the technologies um, and creating that awareness because each technology, as you can see, has different uses and different applications depending on the needs and the goals of the individual. Not everybody is gonna get to the point of home use or community use, but the therapeutic benefits, uh, like Amber said, everyone benefit um, from participating, um, whether it's to increase their stability in their wheelchair, improve their transfers, improve bowel and bladder function, bone density, and things like that. The other awareness is that we have to make aware is the barriers. Um, all over the world, this technology is now available, yet users can't get it. Um, because of healthcare policies and attitudes that walking and standing is not medically necessary or it's still experimental when we've got the research and data that shows the efficacy and the benefits. So creating that awareness is needed by everyone. Advocacy and policy change at a federal or state level is absolutely necessary um, to ensure that insurance companies and other reimbursement mechanisms, depending on your country, aren't blocking access to the latest and greatest in technologies that's been proven to provide um, both health and independent living and quality of life um, benefits. Reimbursement is the biggest challenge. The cost of many of these systems right now is prohibitive because it's almost um, almost all, um, especially in the US, out of pocket right now. Rewalk has gotten a Medicare code, but that in itself presents challenges because if a Rewalk system is paid for by Medicare or a third party insurance provider, will they also purchase the wheelchair that the person's going to need? Because here in the States, Medicare only does in the home. So if they say you can use this in the home, but you need a wheelchair for your main mobility outside of the home, will it still be covered? Because it's both technologies that are more than likely going to be necessary. Getting access to it right now, major the v, some of the VA centers have it, not all. Some rehab centers have it, not all. So um, the physical access of being able to get to the therapy and the training and the assessments um, is, is a challenge. And then having qualified vendors nearby so that they can be maintained. Um, we still need research and development outcomes. Um, that is um, a huge um, part of being able to get these reimbursement um, hurdles 
done. In the states, we also have issues with um, it just because it's approved by Blue Cross in Florida doesn't mean it will be approved in South Carolina or California. Every state is different. And then once that, like Marca said, she took it to the courts, now there's a precedent in the courts. So even though the advances in technology improve, unless we can get national and state level policy changes, now trying to take it even through the courts is gonna be a challenge. So the other is we need to continue to develop and improve. You know, like Michael showed you, it's been an evolution of over several years of getting to where things are, to get things lighter, to get things more dynamic, to get things more intuitive, um, to have the programmability and that, um, and then to get that market out there so that there are there is competition. So one of the challenges that I had is, um, I trialed the um, several different systems, and even though I was successful in these trials, and I had two insurances, um, my doctors, my therapists, the orthotists all agreed this is something that I can benefit from, and I proved I could do it even by sending in videos, um, I couldn't access it. So um, one of the things my organization did is we started the Walk to Walk campaign, which is at walk to the number two walk.org. And so it's in a virtual event site. So basically we're trying to raise funds to provide grants to people so that they can get the technologies um, while we're still fighting the battle for insurance coverage. We're trying to create the awareness and advocacy for access to these devices and coverage. Um, there are program events that we set up that are up live now that you can register for. Um, individuals can host their own event so they would, can fundraise for their own particular cause as well as benefit in the general funds. Um, people can make donations and then their sponsorship opportunities. And so through the walk to walk, we're trying to, you know, just create that avenue and that bridge to help people get to the technologies until we can get the policies and reimbursement coverage in place for people. Because like Marcus said, it's life-changing to be able to have this. And as Jeff said, you know, that when you stand up for the first time and take steps and it's been 30 years, it's, it's just transformational and, you know, and that desire to try to get it. So we do events that are walk, walk to walk, um, ride to walk on bikes, um, run to walk, roll to walk. We even do crawl to walk with pub crawls. So we can get as creative as possible. And we just hope everybody um, will jo join in and um, participate um, globally. The other um, thing now is we'd like to um, move towards um, some questions and answers. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes, um, but we will try to get to any questions that um, aren't um, that we can't get to. Thank you, Sandy. Um, this is Christopher. What what powerful um, stories and fascinating um, walking technology. And Sandy, you can sign me up for the pub crawl. I think that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, we're waiting for COVID to get over. Our pub know, crawl got squashed, so we're hoping this fall. So Oktoberfest. <laughs> Oktoberfest, nice. Um, Rachel, we have three or four questions. Maybe we can hit one um, one of those at least um, for the panelists. Sure. Um, there's a question about how long does it take for users to master using an, a current exoskeleton? Is it hours, days, months, years? I can speak for my um situation. Uh, when I first started, it was two years post-injury just to lift myself up and be stabilized. Um, and I am now almost nine years post-injury this summer, and I am still working to be more stable, to make these more functional. It's it definitely a long process. Um, for me, it's been a long process and it requires a lot of discipline um, and, and um, dedication to doing the work, not only in a clinical setting, but to constantly being physically 
um, engaged however you can be to keep your, your body healthy and working in and out of the devices. Yeah. And, and I can say like for myself, I trialed several different ones and some of the devices I was not able to figure out in like two or three sessions. Um, but others I, within an hour, I had figured it out. And I think, um, the intuitive, you know, the development and getting things to be more intuitive. Um, and I think for me, the evolution of having trialed other ones, I started figuring out the dance and it's really a rhythm that you learn um, in order to use it effectively. And so I'd say it's case by case. Great. Um, we, we are at all time, which I hate because this has been fascinating and has throw, just gone by so fast. Um, thank you all. Um, for participating um, and sharing your stories and sharing the technology. It was truly an honor being a part of this. The next one, um, be on the lookout, is April um, 29th. It's our next new ability um, webinar, so stay tuned to that. Um, you can definitely join us on Twitter at G3ICT, um, hashtag no abilities. And uh, again, uh, thank you, um, panelists. Wonderful job, wonderful job. Take care. Thank you. Sandy, that was excellent. Thanks, Christopher. Really was.